Are You Noble presents Atonement Theories Only. Presenting a class action defamation lawsuit on behalf of those who reject the penal substitutionary atonement theory. Defendant Mike Winger, Bible Thinker Prosecuting the Class Action Defamation Slander Case Troy Geddes, Are You Noble? A defamation lawsuit is a legal action against a person that makes damaging statements against another. This slander case will be conducted in the court of public opinion. Meaning you are the jury. Mike Winger versus Troy Geddes. 538,000 subscribers. 106 subscribers. Averages 57,000 views. Averages 31 views. Beloved pastor. Tired construction worker. YouTube six-part series defending the penal substitutionary atonement theory. Introducing the merciful offering of purification theory. Now this is what Gustav Aulin, I am going to harp on him some more. Gustav Aulin says about Augustine, let me quote him. He says that Augustine, in Augustine's opinion, um, the atonement is, quote, one divine work. It is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. That's what he says about Augustine. This is just, this is just deceitful. To read Irenaeus in the light of the Latin theory is, however, to miss the essential distinction. He does not think of the atonement as an offering made to God by Christ from man's side, or as it were from below. For God remains throughout the effective agent in the work of redemption. The Word of God, who is the creator of all, overcoming him, the devil, through man, per hominem vincens cum, and declaring him an apostate, made him subject to man. The redemptive work is accomplished by the Logos, through the manhood, as his instrument, for it could be accomplished by no power but that of God himself. When Irenaeus speaks in this connection of the obedience of Christ, he has no thought of a human offering made to God from man's side, but rather that the divine will wholly dominated the human life of the Word of God and found perfect expression in his work. Atonement Theories Only Mike has read Christus Victor. He was extremely disappointed with it, and it's written by Gustav Aulin, and he makes it the centerpiece of his case against uh, those who have been deceitful when quoting the early church fathers. So he takes a great deal of time to counter the concepts that Gustav Aline puts in Christus Victor. And Mike at 1657 says Gustav gives a bad rendition of history. And he admits that he did read the book. He, he did read Christus Victor. He says Athanasius was for PSA and August and Gustav was wrong. At 3237, Athanasius, he quotes proving that he did believe PSA, penal substitutionary atonement. And he has another quote that proves that Athanasius believed in penal substitutionary atonement. And Mike's entire argument is that he has read this book and that Gustav continually is telling his audience that these early church fathers did not believe in penal substitutionary atonement. So he's saying Gustav lied, didn't tell the truth about church history. Mike was shocked because Mike himself is a self-proclaimed expert on church history. And he was shocked at how um, badly Gustav misrepresented the early church fathers. Um, for that, he basically says we need to ignore Gustav at 3551. Gregory of Nancy Anzus 
at 36.35, obviously believed in PSA, and, and Gustav is just wrong about that. And same way with John Chrysostom. He he was a proponent of PSA, penal substitutionary atonement. And in Christus Victor, Gustav Alin makes uh, it very clear that John was not an adherent to penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, Mike makes it clear that Gustav is guilty of historical revisionism, that Basil the Great believed in penal substitutionary atonement, and that Mike has read the book. He was shocked. He was unbelievably disappointed in the misquotes, the misrepresentation. Those who have studied church history their entire lives made it their, their life's ambition to know what the uh, anti-Nicene uh, church fathers taught, like a guy like David Berceau, uh, Mike calls them all deceitful and de and that they're deceptive because they didn't embrace penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, Augustine was for penal substitutionary atonement as taught by the reformers. Um, Augustine, once again, he has a quote at 4331. And the one that we're going to look at today, 4415 through 4425, Mike makes a quote that proves the reason Mike has trouble reading the early church fathers is Mike doesn't understand what the early church was trying to resolve, which was had far more to do with the incarnation. Who was Jesus Christ? Why did he become human? What was the purpose of the incarnation? And we're going to see where Mike is making a huge mistake leaning into Nestorianism as he mocks Gustav Alin and his teaching, and, and we'll, we'll go through that in this, in this episode. And of course, Cyril of Alexandria was completely hardcore penal substitutionary atonement, just like the reformers were. So, so Mike is mocking Christus Victor, Gustav Alin. He says that all that Gustav said, all these guys were against penal substitutionary atonement, and that we should not read this book because of it that Gustav is just deceitful. And he goes on to say when he's talking about um, Basil the Great at about 4208, he says that these people are dishonest, they're deceptive, and they're dumb. So these at people like myself who do not believe in penal substitutionary atonement like David Brousseau and other church historians, they are deceptive when they tell you that the early church believed in Christus Victor and not against penal substitutionary atonement, and that they did not believe or, or embrace penal substitutionary atonement. Now, here's what the Bible thinker's huge mistake is. This is an excerpt from the book that we're going to look at in this episode. The same teaching about the divine love is dominant in Augustine. He shows that the race of men is delivered into the power of the devil on the account of its sin. Guilt rests on the whole race. Yet God does not cease to love mankind. And in the incarnation is proof of the greatness of his love. His love, okay, so the incarnation is the proof of the greatness of his love. John three sixteen maybe. His love could not be more clearly revealed by the coming of his son into fellowship with us to take upon himself our sufferings and the evil that rests upon us. So his love could not be more clearly revealed than in the coming of his son into fellowship with us, the incarnation. So thereby we are saved, justified by his blood, reconciled to God through the death of his son, delivered from the wrath. This is Augustine's answer to the question, cure Dios homo, which is why did God become man? His treatment is more powerful than that of Athanasius and his outlook wider. But the main idea is the same. The incarnation has its basis in God's love. The work of the incarnate is the work of divine love. That is it. That it is that overcomes the tyrants and affects atonement between God and the world. So it's the divine love, the incarnate divine love that overcomes tyrants and affects atonement between God and the world. 
It is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side from below. That's the part Mike is mocking, and he is so wrong about this. First of all, it is referring to the work of the incarnation, not only exclusively the cross. Talk about being deceptive. So Mike makes people think that Gustav is re referring solely to the cross and the crucifixion when, when it comes to the work of redemption, when the early church did not do that. The early church was completely about who was Jesus Christ. Was he fully God? Was he fully human? Was he one person or two persons? What, did he have two natures or not? Those were the discussions that were happening at the time of these quotes. Had nothing to do about God pouring his wrath out on his son for appeasement so that the scales of justice would be satisfied. Nothing. Zero. It is one divine work. The incarnation is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side from below. Mike's Nestorianism influence causing him to mock Gustav. At 44.25, the atonement is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering from man's side from below. Mike mocks that statement. So St. Augustine had no concept of Christ being offered to God from man's side from below. That's Nestorianism, Mike. So we have a defendant defending penal substitutionary atonement theory who says the atonement is one divine work, the continuity of which is interrupted by the idea of an offering from man's side from below. The atonement is one divine work, the continuity of which is interrupted by the idea of an offering from man's side from below. Plaintiff. The incarnation is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering from man's side from below. The incarnation is what the early church spoke of. So we have a contrast here. On one side, you have the defendant who's saying the atonement is interrupted, and on the right side, the plaintiff saying the incarnation did not interrupt the continuity by a man's offering from man's side. So we have the Trinity. The Western idea of the Trinity here is Mike's problem. So he sees God and he sees man. And he sees the death of man as an appeasement to the wrath of God, to, to satisfy the justice of God. So there was a separation in some sense where God was punishing a man as a substitute on our behalf who had not sinned, who was completely perfect, therefore satisfied the requirement for God to punish man as a substitute. So you have God, you have man. The atonement is one divine work, the continuity of which is interrupted by the idea of an offering from man's side below. So you have man's offering to God. You have the incarnation, the earthly life, the ministry, the death. This is where man's side comes in. This is the man's side of Mike's equation. The resurrection and the exaltation. So all of that stack in the middle talks about the incarnation, God's, God coming to the earth. But exclusively, Mike says it's man who offers himself to God, so he's a peace. So it was Jesus as man that satisfied God's need for retributive justice, where his wrath is poured out on an individual so that he could then declare other guilty men innocent. Substitutionary penal death. 
So you have love from above over here on the right that's not interrupted. The, the continuity is not broken from below. God's love from above through the incarnation and specifically looking at the Eastern Orthodox view or the, the night, basically the Chalcedian view of the Trinity where the Father is the source of the Trinity. You have the resurrection is primary. It's the trumpet call. It's the victory. It's, it's the way God reconciles the world to himself. He is both the reconciled and the reconciler in this equation. You have God the Father. You have the Son who is begotten, who is not separate. It's one will. The Son is begotten of the Father. They are one and the same. Both are God, deity from deity. And you have the Holy Spirit who proceeds from God the Father. The source of the Trinity is God the Father. There is no separation. There can be no separation. God the Son is God begotten of the Father. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself. So you have man's offering to appease God, God's justice satisfied. Or you have love from above. Continuity is not broken from below. The incarnation, the earthly life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, the exaltation are all God's doing by grace. Um, so Augustine has no sense in which Jesus is being offered to God. But let me read what Augustine actually says on this topic from his work in Caridian. Now, this is not just wordplay. This is not just mere semantics. This is the difference between gospel or no gospel. This is a difference between a God of love and a God uh, of narcissism and self-importance and distance and withdrawal. No, it is a loving father. See, the problem here is that the church, unfortunately, does not believe in the Trinity. Today is what the early Christians believed about the Trinity. Now, actually, I should be able to cover this whole topic in less than a minute simply by saying the early Christians believed the Nicene Creed. That's what they believed about the Trinity. And that should take care of the matter. However, it doesn't because most professing Christians today actually don't believe the Nicene Creed. Now, they'll tell you to their face that they do believe it, but the truth is they don't. As I've said, most Western Christians do not believe the Nicene Creed, even though they say that they do. As I said earlier, I should be able to cover this topic in less than a minute by simply saying that the early Christians believed the Nicene Creed. All Christians should know exactly what that creed means, and nothing further should have to be said on the subject. However, because there is such widespread ignorance on the subject of the Trinity, it won't work to just say that. In fact, the doctrine of the Trinity has become so jumbled that I'm not even going to be able to adequately cover it in an hour. Which is Let me tell you, the real Trinity is a loving Father manifest through the Son and the power of a very real and tangible Holy Ghost. See, the thing is, most of you have never read the Church Fathers. So when a guy like Zahn or a guy like Chalk, Steve Chalk, comes out and they tell you their rendition of church history, you just take it for granted that they're giving you a right rendition of church history. So when they want to undermine a doctrine and then they revise church history, revisionism, they give you a fake version, they can really shatter your confidence in, a, in something that you've believed because it's in the scripture. And um, I think that's, yeah, that's why. That's why I did this video. So, uh, and I, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a scholar. I'm not trying to pretend to be a scholar. But I, as we have taken John three sixteen, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And what people have heard is God so hated the world that He killed His only Son. The two hundreds, we have this from Origen. Origen. Now, now I want to come back real quick to this guy uh, before I mention Origen. This guy, um, Aulin, uh, Gustav Aulin, this guy wrote the book Christus Victor. And what he did in this book was he did like a historical survey of all these various. And by the way, one of one of you guys sent me this book when you heard I was talking about doing PSA sometime in the future. And I'm grateful for that. It was Gary. And I appreciate Gary you sending it to me. Um, but 
So, so Mike is mocking Christus Victor, Gustav Aline. He says that all that Gustav said, all these guys were against penal substitutionary atonement and that we should not read this book because of it. That Gustav is just deceitful. And he goes on to say when he's talking about um, Basil the Great at about 4208, he says that these people are dishonest, they're deceptive, and they're dumb. So talking about Latin theory versus classic theory and subjective theory. And by Latin theory, he's talking about an atonement that is directed toward God. It's the goal is to change God. By classic theory, he thinks the goal is to change the world situation. Uh, and when people write books, the, somehow the anti-PSA people just ignore them. And this is why I want to make this video. So Gustav Lulan did not uh, actually mention penal substitution in his book at all. He's lived from 330 to 379. He says the following. Uh, by the blood of Christ, through faith, we have been cleansed from all sin. By the blood of Christ, through faith, we've been cleansed. So uh, my sins are getting dealt with, washed away by Jesus' blood. This is Old Testament terminology. This has to do with sacrificial, dying for sins, for expiation stuff. So there's elements of penal substitution. <laughs> too. And that's another guy, Basil the Great, who Gustav Allen says is a Christus Victor guy to set him against penal substitution. So Gustav Lulan did not... Oh. Um, uh, actually mentioned penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking. And when people write books, the somehow the PSA people just ignore them. And this is why I want to make this video. They want to act like everybody in the early church was Christus Victor against PSA or something like that. And this is just deceptive. It's deceptive to you and it's dishonest and it's dumb. All right. So Gustav Lulan did not, uh, actually mentioned penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking. And when people write books, the somehow the PSA people just ignore them. Because in the secondary literature, guys like Gustav Aulin, if you've read his work, Christus Victor, that's the book here, Christus Victor, he offered his bad rendition of history. Aulin wants to make it sound like origins against penal substitution. So Gustav Aulin did not, uh, actually mentioned penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking. And when people write books, the somehow the PSA people just ignore them. He really does. And he uh, he's wrong. And I'm going to show you several other guys he was wrong about, Alan. And, I, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm not trying to pretend to be a scholar. But I'm 4th century as well, 300 to 373. And he's another one of Alan's guys. He says, Athanasius, man, this is another guy who's a Christus Victor, not PSA guy. So Gustav Ulan did not... Oh. Uh, actually mentioned penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking. Thus, taking a body like our own, because all our bodies were liable to the corruption of death, he surrendered his body to death in place of all and offered it to the Father. That's important. He offered it to the Father. It's not just a model or a moral example. It is a moral example. It's not just or only a moral example, right? It's an offering to the Father, a sacrifice like of the Old Testament kind. This he did out of sheer love for us, I read on. So that in his death all might die, and the law of death thereby be abolished because, having fulfilled in his body that for which it was appointed, it was thereafter voided of its power for men. Now, let me give you another one from Athanasius, because this is a big deal. He, Aulin puts him up as like a big chief example of someone who's not PSA. So Gustav Ulan did not... Uh, actually mentioned penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking. And when people write books, the somehow the PSA people just ignore them. And this is why I want to make this video. Um, okay, there's more there. But uh, I just want to say now, on Gustav Aulin, I won't keep harping on, the, harping on this guy, but, but he's the scholarly source of a lot of this divergence from PSA. And, I, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm not trying to pretend to be a scholar. But I, Gustav Aulin did not... Uh, actually mentioned penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking. I read his little book and I was shocked at how, because I had already studied some of the church fathers and I'm like reading his going, wait, that's not even remotely accurate. And, I, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm not trying to pretend to be a scholar, but I, I just slowly got more and more disappointed that this is the guy people go to, Gustav Aulin. Um, people need to ignore his, his stuff on this topic, I think, or else they're going to be radically confused 
and they're going to think they're rejecting PSA for good reasons when they're just being tricked about history. I but Gustav Ulan did not uh, actually mention penal substitution in his book at all. Stuff. So there's elements of penal substitution in that too. And that's another guy, Basil the Great, who Gustav Aulin says is a Christus Victor guy to set him against penal substitution. But Gustav Ulan did not uh, actually mention penal substitution. As they want to act like everybody in the early church was Christus Victor against PSA or something like that. And this is just deceptive. It's deceptive to you and it's dishonest and it's dumb. All right, I'll into Christus Victor later in more detail. It's just the idea that Jesus had victory over Satan, sin, and the world. Hey, like everyone has to believe this, but hey, here is what I found in the early Christian writings. So I recorded the cassette series. Later, it became a CD series on what the early Christians believed about the atonement. And yes, I did receive some criticism, but actually it wasn't as heavy as I was expecting. Probably because I wasn't presenting it dogmatically, trying to force it down anyone's throat. And one of the things that I make clear in those messages is that the early Christian view of the atonement embraces far more than just Christus Victor, if by Christus Victor you mean only Christ's victory over Satan and his freeing mankind from death and Hades. Rather, in that series of messages, I discuss seven things that Jesus' incarnation, his life, and his death accomplished. And I'll just summarize them for you real quick. I go into them in detail in the messages. The first, the early Christians talk about forgiveness for our sins rather than payment to God, that God had to be paid before he could forgive us. Secondly, they talk about a ransom, a ransom not paid to the Father, but paid to Satan. If they discuss at all who it's paid to, it's to Satan to set us free and that he took Jesus as the ransom price. They talk about his sacrificial death, but as I said, it was a heroic sacrifice, the type that a hero makes in battle. They talk about Satan binding the strong man, as I've mentioned. They talk about Christ's blood cleansing us from sin, allowing us to be reconciled to the Father. They talk about the fact that Jesus became the second Adam. And by becoming the second Adam, he undid our mortality and our corruption. And finally, they taught that Christ came not just to die, but to teach us the ways of his father. So his life, we're saved by his life, not just by his, his death. So you're going to see all of that in the early Christian model. Now, for the rest of tonight's presentation, I'm going to sum all of that up and call it Christus Victor. But maybe in a more exact sense, Christus Victor should be narrowly used in the sense of his victory over Satan and the freedom that he brought for us uh, through that, and maybe in connection with it, the ransoming that he did by uh, letting Satan kill him in our place. But like I say, we will include all of that. So I hope you can see that the early Christian view of the atonement wasn't this you know, narrow thing that, oh, he defeated Satan and that's it. No, there was a lot of things um, that, that they believed. Okay, now I want to talk about some of the old uh, quotations from the early Christians that are often quoted. And they're quoted in the sense, uh-huh, see, they did teach uh, penal substitution. I've looked up a lot of these quotations, but, you know, I would say to those who, who use those quotes that, again, as I said at the very beginning, I think you're reading penal substitution back into uh, their quotations when they sp don't specifically say anything about it. In other words, if you start out with penal substitution in your mind, yeah, you can find quotations in the early Christians that seem to fit within the general framework, but they also fit within the general framework of, in the larger sense, what I'm calling Christus Victor right now. See, the thing is, most of you have never read the Church Fathers. So when a guy like Zahn or a guy like Chalk, Steve Chalk, comes out and they tell you their rendition of church history, you just take it for granted that they're giving you a right rendition of church history. So when they want to undermine a doctrine and then they revise church history, revisionism, they give you a fake version, they can really shatter your confidence in, a, in something that you've believed because it's in the scriptures. 
And um, I think that's, yeah, that's why, that's why I did this video. So, uh, but what you are not going to find is that you're not going to find any quotes that talk about the father punishing his son or about God's justice needing to be satisfied. That is not in the pre-Nicene Christian writings. You'll talk, you know, you'll, we'll find a handful of quotes that talk about Jesus being punished in our place or carrying our sins or offering himself as a sacrifice. But as, as we've already said, those teachings fit within the early Christian framework, the Christus Victor framework, if we're going to call it that. They don't just fit in the framework of penal substitution. So we need to understand that. Now, in contrast, if you start with a blank slate and then you start and read the early Christian writings in chronological order, number one, you will not find any developed doctrine of penal substitution. Number two, you will not find any statements that God poured out his wrath on his son, as I've said. You will not find any statements that God's justice had to be satisfied. And so he punished his son instead of punishing us. You're not going to find that. You will not find any statements that Jesus descended into Gehenna, into hellfire, and that he was tormented there. Okay. So let's look at some of these. Uh, and I, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a scholar. I'm not trying to pretend to be a scholar. But I, now this is what Gustav Aulin, I am going to harp on him some more. Gustav Aulin says about Augustine, let me quote him. He says that Augustine, in Augustine's opinion, um, the atonement is, quote, one divine work. It is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. Him to mock Gustav. At 4425, the atonement is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering from man's side, from below. Mike mocks that statement. So St. Augustine had no concept of Christ being offered to God from man's side from below. That's Nestorianism, Mike. Like the, um, the idea that Aulin gives everyone in the world, because he's a very popular guy, that Augustine had no concept of Christ being offered to God. Alexandria, another guy Aulin says doesn't support PSA. So Gustav Lalan did not... Uh, actually mentioned penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking. Bottom line is the anti PSA crowd, as I bring it all together now, conclusion, summary, thoughts on this stuff, the anti PSA crowd, they regularly distort church history. They but what you are not going to find is that you're not going to find any quotes that talk about the father punishing his son or about God's justice needing to be satisfied. That is not in the pre-Nicene Christian writings. They act like there's these competing atonement theories when they're actually complementary aspects of the atonement. They act like it came from Calvin or Anselm in the 1100s or late, late 1000s. They act like it came from those guys and they ignore all these quotes from the church fathers. And when people write books, PSA people just ignore them. And this is why I wanna make this video because it's deceitful and they're trying to, to jerk you around and change your theology with deceitful information about church history. That, I don't... Gustav Lalonde did not uh, actually mention penal substitution in his book at all. He's talking about Latin theory versus classic theory and subjective theory. And by Latin theory, he's talking about an atonement that is directed toward God. It's, the goal is to change God. By classic theory, he thinks the goal is to change the world situation um, whether you think that's by ransom to Satan, which is simply a subset of that, or overcoming the powers, as Ulan puts it, and so forth. 2. The Incarnation and the Atonement It is usually said that the main theological effort of the early church was exerted in the sphere of Christology, and this is true, insofar as its most monumental result is seen in the formulae of the ecumenical councils. But it is not always clearly understood that the Christological definitions were worked out in close connection with a quite definite view of Christ's redemptive work, which, though it found no explicit place in the definitions, was present in the background throughout. Studying Christology along with the early church is an important and exciting task. In these discussions, we see some of the earliest thinking about the person and work of Jesus Christ. 
Surveying the first four councils of the early church can also be a helpful aid in our understanding of the task of Christology. The fourth council at Chalcedon is particularly important. At Chalcedon, the leaders and theologians of the early church reached a consensus about the most faithful ways to express what we believe about the one person of Jesus Christ. The document that was produced at this council is called the Definition of Chalcedon, and it represents the culmination of many years of hard thinking about who God is and who Jesus is. By this point in history, too, all the hard questions that can be asked of the Trinity and Jesus had been asked. Think of the statements in the definition of Chalcedon in terms of a box. We could call it the Chalcedonian box. Each side of the box represents a Christological affirmation that identifies the outer boundaries of the biblical teaching about Jesus. These Chalcedonian categories can help us as we read the gospel narratives. So first, there's the upper boundary of the box. This represents the affirmation that Jesus is fully divine. Second, there's the lower boundary of the box. This represents the affirmation that Jesus is fully human. Third, there's the left boundary of the box. This represents the affirmation that Jesus is one person. And finally, there's the right boundary of this box, which represents the affirmation that Jesus has two natures. Together, these represent the major affirmations of the first four councils. Now, once we have these boundaries in place, we can see how they got there in the first place and also how they can be useful to us as interpreters. The upper boundary is established at the first council of Nicaea in 325 AD. This council denied Arianism, which taught that Jesus was a creature created by the Father. Thus, Jesus was not fully God. The key theological assumption at this council was that only God can save us. If Jesus was not fully divine, then he could not save humanity because as the scriptures teach, only God himself is mighty to save. This upper boundary was then firmly established. Jesus is fully divine. Now the lower boundary is established at the second council at Constantinople in 381 AD. This council denied Apollinarianism, which taught that Jesus had a human body, but not a human mind or a human soul. If what Apollinarius taught was true, then Jesus was not truly human. For the theologians at this council, this was unacceptable. The key theological assumption here was, what is not assumed is not healed. They reasoned like this, if every part of humanity was corrupted by sin, then Christ must assume every part of humanity in order to redeem it. In order for Jesus to save humanity, he must have had a human experience. This lower boundary was then firmly established. Jesus is fully human. This left side of the boundary is then firmly established. Jesus is one person. The final boundary is established at the fourth council at Chalcedon in 451 AD. This council denied Eutychianism, which taught that Jesus' two natures were mixed or confused. The leaders of this council argued that it was a mistake to think that Jesus' two natures were mixed or confused in the Incarnation. The key theological assumption here is that the one person of Jesus Christ has two natures. One of the key statements of the definition of Chalcedon, then, is that Jesus is to be acknowledged in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. The distinction of the natures being no, by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved in concurring in one person. In this statement, we can see the major insights of these four councils. The value of the Chalcedonian boundaries is that they help keep our thinking about Christ grounded in what the Gospels themselves affirm about the God-man Jesus Christ. These boundaries are not simply arbitrary limits put on our thinking. Rather, they are the theological realities that we discover by reading the Gospels. So what's in the middle of the box? The biblical narratives themselves in particular, the gospel narratives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These narratives are at the center of the box and are at the center of our thinking about Christology. From reading and rereading the gospels, we know that these four affirmations, these four major affirmations, are true. The Christology sets forth the paradoxical union of Godhead and manhood in Christ. The idea of redemption 
gives the reason why the subject was felt to be all-important. The organic connection of the idea of the Incarnation with that of the Atonement is the leading characteristic of the doctrine of redemption in the early Church. The central thought is the same that we have already seen in Irenaeus. We must next ask how Irenaeus sets forth the actual accomplishment of the work of atonement, and what special features he emphasizes in his portrayal of Christ. We shall see that he traces a continuous line from the Incarnation through the entire earthly life of Christ and his death to his resurrection and exaltation, and that no one point in this line claims anything like an exclusive emphasis. It is God himself who enters into this world of sin and death for man's deliverance, to take up the conflict with the powers of evil and effect atonement between himself and the world. Gregory of Nazianzus sums up the purpose of the Incarnation thus, that God, by overcoming the tyrant, might set us free and reconcile us with himself through his Son. Can you briefly explain the differences between Orthodoxy and Lutheranism? Thank you. Keep up the good work. Well, I mean, Lutheranism is just kind of close to Anglicanism or Episcopalianism, um, except that Luther himself, unfortunately, was very immersed in dialectics, too. Uh, Luther was influenced by the nominalists, uh, influenced by a famous nominalist who was from the school of William of Ockham named Gabriel Bile. And this is how Luther was able to justify a lot of his very strange positions. So Luther eventually came to despise the Old Testament, and in this way, he's the father of higher criticism. It's not, a, it's not by accident that Wellhausen and Schleiermacher and the famous higher critics come from Luther. <laughs> I mean, they come out of Tübingen, they come out of uh, you know, these, these Lutheran universities, because Luther, uh, in, in a very conscious fashion, set Moses against Christ. I mean, this is like a big part of his theology. I remember when I first started reading you know, classical Reformed theology, Reformation theology, back when I was 18, 19. I had a little bit of a, a period where I considered Lutheranism. I read about five or six of Luther's commentaries on uh, New Testament books, his commentary on Romans, uh, Jude, Peter, uh, Corinthians, or not Corinthians, uh, Eph Ephesians, excuse me, Galatians and Ephesians. Uh, you know, I read the other Lutheran works about the Jews, about... Um, uh, bondage of the will, um, and what we get in these works is, again, uh, a very strict dialectical tension between grace and law, between Christ and Moses, between freedom and slavery and man. Uh, man's nature is essentially bondage. And in the bondage of the will, he says that man is a an ass that is either ridden by God or the devil. Well, in the history of the church, what I was surprised to eventually find out was that most of these Reformation heresies, whether it's Lutheranism or Calvinism or Zwingliism or whoever, Melanchthon, it doesn't matter, um, the, these are regurgitations, uh, whether they know it or not, of ancient heresies. And the most striking way to really refute whether it's Lutheranism or Calvinism or classical Protestantism is, number one, to talk about the Trinitarian implications of the theology of the redemption or penal the penal death of Christ in their view. So the, the the penal sanctions of the fall in that view are that we were we were due eternal death, and so and the only way to be saved was that Christ would have to take that debt that we incurred upon Himself. That of course is the sufferings and torments of hell. That's the payment that was due, right? Uh, the problem with this is that when you adopt the traditional Ca uh, Calvinist Reformation, Westminster Confession, J John Owen, Spurgeon, Charles Hodge, and many of the Lutherans, but Luther was very into this idea. I'm not so sure about all the post-Lutheran Lutherans, but um, Luther was very into this idea that, that Jesus was damned by the Father. So we have the Trinity... The Western idea of the Trinity here is Mike's problem. So he sees God and he sees man. And he sees the death of man as an appeasement to the wrath of God, to, to satisfy the justice of God. So there was a separation in some sense where God was punishing a man as a substitute on our behalf who had not sinned, who was completely perfect, therefore satisfied the requirement for God to punish man. 
in fact, Ryan Dawson brought that up to me uh, as a, a an argument against Christianity. And I said, you know what? Only Orthodox Christianity consistently has uh, argued against this idea. And the origins of this the idea, of course, go back to Anselm and Anselm, Anselm's uh, theories of the atonement, atonement. The atonement. They act like it came from Calvin or Anselm in the 1100s or late late 1000s. They act like it came from those guys. And Which are, of course, the results of divine simplicity and Augustinian presuppositions. There's no question about it. I've read all these things. I've read all the Anselmian works. I've read all this stuff. So Athanasius and Augustine discuss at length the answer to the question, Cur Deus Homo? The treatise of Athanasius on the incarnation of the Word is wholly occupied with this subject. He argues that through the transgression, sin has subjected the race of men to death's power, and on this account death has legal rights over men. But God's purpose cannot come to naught, for his love for the fallen race persists in spite of the judgment upon them. Therefore the Word becomes man that he may restore the life that had been lost. For this was the one possible way that life, the life of God, should enter into the world of men and prevail over death. It is evident that such a view must lay emphasis not merely on the death of Christ, but also on his victory, his triumph, his passage through death to life. According to Anselm, Christ became man primarily in order that he might die. But this isolation of the death of Christ is impossible for the patristic view. Death is, indeed, the way by which the victory is won, but the emphasis lies on the victory. Therefore, the note of triumph sounds like a trumpet call through the teaching of the early church. Jarvis J. Williams only talks about the Latin side of it. Um, the, in his definition, the propitiation of God, um, he doesn't talk about anything else. If you were to write your description of the atonement, could you do that in a paragraph? What would that look oh, like? It's a great point, and, it, and it's an important point you're bringing up. Um, if that's going to be, quote, my definition of the atonement, then it'd be very wrong just to quote it like Jarvis quoted it. Um, it's, a, it's a good point you're making. And so to, it would have to incorporate both elements of that, because I think N.T. Wright makes the, the, the point, and I think it's an excellent point, that according to this kind of a theory, this, this reduce, and, and I would say that, that the PSA by itself is very much a reductionist view. Um, you could literally have Jesus coming as a baby, being crucified as a baby, and it wouldn't change your theology at all. That's all your Christianity, that's your salvation. And N.T. Wright makes that argument. I think it's a very good argument. Um, but here we must stop to face a question that we had to ask in our study of Irenaeus. Can it truly be said, that Athanasius and his successors emphasized the thought of deliverance from death and from death's power at the expense of that of deliverance from sin? Do they give us, as we are so often told, a physical doctrine of salvation? It is especially relevant to ask this question while we are thinking of Athanasius, because he frequently dwells on the thought of deliverance from the power of death, but makes less mention of the devil than almost any of the fathers, and there are a number of passages in his writings which, if taken in isolation, might easily suggest that he really does neglect the idea of sin. Thus, in one place, he asks whether God could have adopted some other way than that of the Incarnation, and replies that for the gaining of salvation, it might well have been sufficient that man should repent, if the only problem had been that of sin, and not of corruption and death, as the consequence of sin. But since through sin men had lost the divine image, and become subject to death, on this account the Word must come and deliver them from the power of corruption. From such passages it might appear that the need for Christ's coming and his redemptive work had arisen exclusively out of the consequences of sin and not out of the sin itself. And so, that the work of Christ had only an indirect relation to sin. Um, but, so let's go back to bondage of the will. In bondage of the will, Luther says there is no free will in man. Uh, you're either ridden by God or the devil. So this is a kind of the equivalent, um, a little more extreme equivalent version actually of total depravity. Uh, you know, Calvin at least still has has verbal homage to free will, uh, even if it's a, a strict predestinarian system. But uh, in Lutheranism and in the Lutheran confessions too, Heidelberg and so forth, it's not like a, this is just to Luth in Luther. Uh, the idea is that the only way that man can be saved because he's so fallen is because uh, he needs irresistible grace or he needs some kind of uh, efficacious movement of grace because man is inherently fallen to the point of always 
being in opposition to God. This is dialectics. The best way to refute this is to read St. Maximus's dispute with Pyrrhus up, and guess what? Then you realize that monothelitism and monener- monergism or monenergism, myophysitism, uh, this has already been dealt with. The church has already dealt with the heresy that man loses his will or has lost his will in the fall and that the grace of God has to overcome it. Uh, no, man always retains his natural energy. Now he requires grace, which is supernatural, which lifts him up and deifies him. Sure. But even fallen man retains the image of God in the Orthodox conception. He's lost the li- lost the likeness of God, but he's not lost the image of God. So the idea that fallen people only sin all the time, uh, that's heresy. It's the Manichaean heresy. And it's also the heresy of monothelitism because there's always synergy. The synergy, the human energy that operates, it's not enough to save man, right? So we're not saying salvation by works, but there's always cooperation because man never loses his natural energy. How do we know that? We know that because of the centuries of theology, of Christology. The Christology that the councils dealt with solve the problems of soteriology. This is what. But such an interpretation would not be just either to Athanasius or to the other Greek fathers. Athanasius does, in fact, regard sin as not merely the cause of the corruption from which men need to be saved, but as being identical with it. That is to say, Christ's work has a direct relation to sin. He came in order that he might break the power of sin over human life. He came that he might set all free from sin and the curse of sin, and that all might evermore live in truth, free from death, and be clothed in incorruption and immortality. It may- into Christus Victor later in more detail. It's just the idea that Jesus had victory over Satan, sin, and the world. It may indeed be said that the forgiveness of sin is not proclaimed with the same power as by the reformers, that the Greek theologian does not sound the depths like Luther. But this does not justify the allegation that the idea of sin takes only a subordinate place, and that his conception of salvation is purely physical and natural, the bestowing of immortality on human nature through the divine nature of Christ. If the thought of the triumph of life and the overcoming of mortality takes the central place, it is intimately connected with the breaking of sin's power. The work of Christ is the overcoming of death and sin, and further, the note of triumph which rings through this Greek theology depends not only on the victory of Christ over death accomplished once for all, but also on the fact that his victory is the starting point for his present work in the world of men, where he, through his Spirit, ever triumphantly continues to break down sin's power and deifies men. Into Christus Victor later in more detail, it's just the idea that Jesus had victory over Satan, sin, and the world. Why the church historically didn't begin with Romans and justification and soteriology when it, when it tried to explicate how it is we are made right with God. It begins with Christology and the Trinity. This is what the church worked out historically because you can't get your soteriology right if your Christology is wrong. Teaching about Jesus. These Chalcedonian categories can help us as we read the gospel narratives. So first, there's the upper boundary of the box. This represents the affirmation that Jesus is fully divine. Second, there's the lower boundary of the box. This represents the affirmation that Jesus is fully human. Third, there's the left boundary of the box. This represents the affirmation that Jesus is one person. And finally, there's the right boundary of this box, which represents the affirmation that Jesus has two natures. This is why Arianism was such a big deal in the early church, because it ultimately affects soteriology is established at the First Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. This council denied Arianism, which taught that Jesus was a creature created by the Father. Thus, Jesus was not fully God. The key theological assumption at this council was that only God can save us. If Jesus was not fully divine, then He could not save humanity, because as the Scriptures teach, only God Himself is mighty to save. This upper boundary was then firmly established. Jesus is fully divine. Now the lower boundary is established at the Second Council at Constantinople in 381 AD. This council denied Apollinarianism, which taught that Jesus had a human body, but not a human mind or a human soul. If what Apollinarius taught was true, then Jesus was not truly human. For the theologians at this council, this was unacceptable. 
the key theological assumption here was what is not assumed is not healed. They reasoned like this. If every part of humanity was corrupted by sin, then Christ must assume every part of humanity in order to redeem it. In order for Jesus to save humanity, he must have had a human experience. This lower boundary was then firmly established. Jesus is fully human. But Protestantism and evangelicalism begin with soteriology. So in other words, they have the wrong order of theologia, have the wrong order of theology. You can't do your soteriology and do your Christology and your triadology as an afterthought. It will end you up in heresy. So the easiest way to refute Protestantism, Calvinism, Lutheranism, classically speaking, is to point out that to say that Jesus was damned by the Father requires Jesus to be two people, it requires a human Jesus who could be damned and a divine Jesus who's the Son of God. Divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. That Calvin, who accepts the thesis of penal substitution, our absolution consists, he writes, in this, that the obligation to be punished has been shifted to the Son of God. This compensation is to be kept in mind above all else if we are not to tremble with fear and anxiety throughout our lives. As if we were still threatened by that just vengeance of God, which the Son of God took upon himself. God avenged him justly on God made man. If Christ had died a bodily death only, this would have contributed nothing to our redemption. Let me tell you, the real Trinity is a loving Father manifest through the Son and the power of a very real and tangible Holy Ghost. On the other hand, it was especially valuable that he should feel simultaneously the severity of the divine vengeance and that in answering for us before God's justice, he should thus satisfy his righteous judgment. On such a view, one must speak of the enmity or wrath of the Father with his Son. Such expressions continue to signify the exercise of retributive justice on the Savior because of our sins. As we have taken John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. And what people have heard is God so hated the world that he killed his only Son. That's called Nestorianism. Nestorianism is the ancient heresy of Nestorius that... There are two persons in Christ who kind of mingle together, and at times we see one kind of poking through, and the other poking through. When he's eating, that's the human person, Jesus of Nazareth. When he's walking on water, that's the Son of God, because only, uh, you know, only God could do that, right? Well, if you read the entire debate between Cyril and Nestorius, what you come to learn is that this has already been dealt with. And it was, in fact, a Nestorian argument that when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have, you, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus was being cut off from the Father. The only way to have <laughs> Jesus cut off from the Father is to say that he's a human person. That's literally what Nestorius said. No. So what did Ephesus decide and what became the norm for orthodoxy? The boundary on the left side is established at the third council at Ephesus in 431 AD. This council denied Nestorianism which taught that Jesus' two natures were totally distinct. Nestorius seemed to treat Jesus' human nature and his divine nature as if they were two distinct persons. Led by Cyril of Alexandria, the theologians at this council argued that this was not acceptable. Rather, the one person of Jesus Christ was in fact the second person of the Trinity, the Word, God the Son. The focus here was on the mysterious union of humanity and deity in the one person of Jesus Christ, who is the Word that became flesh. See, Jesus on the cross, the Father was not turning his back on Jesus. The Father wasn't blind to us or blind to Jesus because he was too holy. No, Jesus was stepping into our blindness to the goodness of God. See, if you think that on the cross the Trinity was imploding on itself, 
that the father was, was turning away and rejecting the son. Look, if the father turned his back on us or the son of the world, we would evaporate in less than a second. The Trinity was not imploding on itself on the cross. Matter of fact, the cross was the full expression of the love of the entire Trinity. If you think the Trinity was turning on itself, then you're going to have quite a bit of a problem with the scriptures. And I have a few of them right here. For instance, John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. That was never temporarily suspended on the cross. John 14, 11, he says, believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The Father didn't jump out of Jesus on the cross. John 6, 46, no one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. The word also means with God. Only he has seen the Father. Jesus was from God and always with the Father. He was from heaven and always in heaven, in heaven on earth. That was always the case. John 16, 32, he said to the disciples, he says, you guys will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone. What's he talking about when he went to the cross? You'll leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. And of course, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the cosmos to himself. John 8, 28 and 29. Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, whenever he talks about being lifted up, he meant being lifted up on the cross. Just as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will know that I am he, that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who has sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. We have this idea that the Father had to turn his back on us, that the Father was too holy. I mean, doesn't the scripture say that, that his eyes are too pure to look on evil? Let me tell you something. God was never, ever, ever your enemy. That's right. You get that, it's going to change your Christianity. God was never your enemy. We have this idea, oh, but brother... We were in enmity with God in our sins. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled us through Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. But wasn't the Father too pure to look upon our sins? See, we're okay for Jesus to step down and for him to take the sins of the world upon himself. It's okay for Jesus to hang out with mafioso tax collectors and prostitutes, hookers, and, and bad, you know, hooligans. Because, of course, Jesus is not as holy as the Father, right? Which is to say he's not God, which is to say you're not a Christian. Maybe we're a little mixed up on this. Doesn't the scriptures say that he can't look upon evil. It does say that. Why don't we read it in context? Habakkuk 1.13 says, Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. So why then are you doing it? Maybe what we're dealing with here is Habakkuk's own misunderstanding of the nature of God. Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? We are dealing with Habakkuk's own misunderstanding, just like Adam misunderstood the nature of God. Adam running away, hiding in the bushes, trying to pull away from relationship out of fear and rejection and insecurity. And so some of you will say, well, wasn't there a sin problem that needed to be dealt with? Wasn't there this separation that had to be dealt with? Well, there was a separation that needed to be dealt with. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see... Your sin separated you from God, but your sin never separated God from you. 
Where are you going to run from a God who's everywhere? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to hide? You see, sin caused us to pull away. Like Adam, it caused us to retreat, us to hide away, us to look for a place where God was not. Our sins separated us from God. It did not separate God from us. Now, this is not just wordplay. This is not just mere semantics. This is the difference between gospel or no gospel. This is a difference between a God of love and a God of narcissism and self-importance and distance and withdrawal. No, it is a loving Father. See, the problem here is that the church, unfortunately, does not believe in the Trinity. Let me tell you, the real Trinity is a loving Father manifest through the Son and the power of a very real and tangible Holy Ghost. It's the trumpet call. It's the victory. It's, it's the way God reconciles the world to himself. He is both the reconciled and the reconciler in this equation. You have God the Father. You have the Son who is begotten, who is not separate. It's one will. The Son is begotten of the Father. The Greek fathers frequently discuss whether God could not have saved men by some other way than that of the drama of the Incarnation and Redemption, and in particular, whether he could not have chosen to exert his power and by his almighty fiat overthrow the tyrants and restore the fallen. Various answers are given. Athanasius replies that the deliverance becomes effective in a wholly different way when it is accomplished, as it were, from within, by God taking manhood, and not from without. Again, it is frequently said that God's righteousness would not have been manifested if he had used mere force. Sometimes there is the implication that the devil has certain rights over men, which God respects. Thus, John of Damascus writes that God could have accomplished his will by force and saved men from the dominion of the tyrant by his almighty power, but then the tyrant would have had cause of complaint if after he had gained dominion over men he had been compelled by force to give them up. Therefore God, who sympathizes with men and loves them, and desires to proclaim the vanquished as victors, becomes man. The Greek fathers find the deepest reason for God's action in an inner divine necessity, the necessity imposed by his love. The argument that the devil has rights over men is not intended as a rational theory of the necessity for the drama of incarnation and redemption. The writer moves in a wholly different plane from Anselm, whose whole preoccupation is with rational demonstration. Because you will see that no other church teaches this. Now, the Roman Catholic Church gives credence to this, certainly. They don't uh, adhere to Nestorius. However, the problem becomes that at the time of Chalcedon and then eventually later for the West, the West really got locked into the Augustinian presuppositions about Christology. And because the West exalted Augustine and followed a lot of the soteriological presuppositions of Augustine, before doing the Christology, they will read Christology through soteriology. Again, this is the improper, incorrect Ordo Theologiae. And when they do that, what they do is that because Augustine did teach predestination and election, and because uh, ultimate perseverance, the gift of perseverance and, and final saving grace is ultimately only for the elect, uh, they will then restrict on that basis the extent of the incarnation. In other words, the, the cosmic scope of the inter incarnation gets lost in the West right here. Because I think N.T. Wright makes the, the, the point, and I think it's an excellent point, that according to this kind of a theory, this, this reduce, and, and I would say that, that the PSA by itself is very much a reductionist view. Um, you could literally have Jesus coming as a baby, being crucified as a baby, and it wouldn't change your theology at all. That's all your Christianity, that's your salvation. And N.T. Wright makes that argument. I think it's a very good argument. Um, uh, the descent of Christ into Hades also gets lost for this reason. Now, when you do that, when you lose what's called the recapitulation, which St. Irenaeus and the Eastern Fathers taught, St. Cyril, St. John of Damascus, St. Maximus, this is why the cosmic mystery of Jesus Christ, uh, St. Maximus Confessor, this is why this is so important, is because this is an antidote. This is a redemptive healing for Western Christianity. This is what has been lost. The same teaching about the divine love is dominant in Augustine. He shows that the race of men is delivered into the power of the devil 
on account of its sin, guilt rests on the whole race. Yet God does not cease to love mankind, and the Incarnation is the proof of the greatness of His love. His love could not be more clearly revealed than by the coming of His Son into fellowship with us, to take upon Himself our sufferings and the evil that rests upon us. Thereby we are saved, justified by His blood, reconciled to God through the death of His Son, delivered from the wrath. This is Augustine's answer to the question, Cur Deus Homo? His treatment is more powerful than that of Athanasius, and his outlook wider, but the main idea is the same. The Incarnation has its basis in God's love. The work of the Incarnate is the work of the Divine Love. This it is that overcomes the tyrants, and effects atonement between God and the world. It is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. Now this is what Gustav Aulin, I am going to harp on him some more. Gustav Aulin says about Augustine, let me quote him, he says that Augustine, in Augustine's opinion, um, the atonement is, quote, one divine work, it is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. That's what he says about Augustine. This is just this is just deceit. Um, so Augustine has no sense in which Jesus is being offered to God. Well, let me read. His treatment is more powerful than that of Athanasius, and his outlook wider. But the main idea is the same. The incarnation has its basis in God's love. The work of the incarnate is the work of the divine love. This it is that overcomes the tyrants and effects atonement between God and the world. It is one divine work the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. Now this is what Gustav Aulin, I am going to harp on him some more. Gustav Aulin says about Augustine, let me quote him, he says that Augustine, in Augustine's opinion, um, the atonement is, quote, one divine work, it is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. That's what he says about Augustine. This is just this is just deceitful. Divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. That, and when we talk about the cosmic aspect of Christ's incarnation, go back and read Saint Irenaeus and Against Heresies when he talks about the recapitulation, where he says that this is the reason for the undoing of Adam's actions. Uh, on the basis of Christ assuming universal human nature. Not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. That's what he says about Augustine. This is just, this is just deceitful. Very radical, crazy idea. This is what Paul says in Acts 17. The Greeks were mystified when Paul preached this resurrection. By the way, why would Paul go preach to a bunch of Greeks resurrection? No, he goes and preaches resurrection, just like the Orthodox Church does. <laughs> Uh, he preaches the resurrection because that's what is a stumbling block to the Greeks because they hate the body. And hatred of the body is demonic. The source of hatred of the body is Satan himself because angels are disembodied. And the fact that the incarnation is in human nature has forever provoked the enmity, jealousy, and hatred of the disembodied, noetic, fallen angels. That's why they hate humanity because humanity is made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God isn't just about us being like a reflection of, of, of God himself, but uh, it's also a, a kind of type of the incarnation. Adam is a type of Christ, Paul says. So long story short, um, this is how Lutheranism, Evangelicalism, Calvinism, they have to posit these very weird views and theories ignorantly to vouchsafe, to protect their very bizarre uh, bean counter payment theology, which none of the church fathers teach. Uh, it's only Anselm that begins to teach this because of the Augustinian presuppositions. I mean, Augustine didn't even teach this, that that uh, God the Father had to be paid this, this infinite debt by killing the Son. That's crazy. The death, this is where man's side comes in. This is the man's side of Mike's equation. The resurrection and the exaltation. So all of that stack in the middle talks about the incarnation. God's God coming to the earth. 
but exclusively, Mike says it's man who offers himself to God. So he's a peace. So it was Jesus as man that satisfied God's need for retributive justice, where his wrath is poured out on an individual so that he could then declare other guilty men innocent. Uh, yes, it is an offering, but when you understand Orthodox theology, the purpose of the death of Christ is to destroy death. Uh, and Christ willingly underwent death because he is a divine person. There was no point at which it was taken from him. He was not cut off from God the Father. That would be a dividing of the Trinity. If Jesus is a divine person, as everybody knows you have to confess, if you don't want to be an historian, then the death of Christ was experienced in his human nature willingly. And the second person of the Godhead, the Logos, did not ever experience being cut off from the Father. To say that the Son is cut off from the Father is to turn one person in the Trinity against another and to divide the Trinity. Well, guess what? There's only one will in God. There's only one will in the Godhead. That's all classic Trinitarian theology across the board. Everybody believes this. And to have one person damn the other person is utterly blasphemous, stupid, and retarded. They want to act like everybody in the early church was Christus Victor against PSA or something like that. And this is just deceptive. It's deceptive to you, and it's dishonest, and it's dumb. All right. So that is the strongest argument right there, right away, for all evangelicalism, classical Calvinism, is that they blasphemously, in their soteriology and their doctrine of penal sanctions and all this, they uh, split the Trinity. And if they don't want to split the Trinity, they're forced to accept the form of Nestorianism where they, have, where they have a human person, Jesus, and a divine person, Son of God. Conclusion The teaching of Irenaeus is clear and consistent and forms a thoroughly typical example of that view of the atonement that we have called the classic idea. It will be useful in conclusion to sum up briefly its essential features. First, then, it must be emphasized that the work of atonement is regarded as carried through by God himself, and this not merely in the sense that God authorizes, sanctions, and initiates the plan of salvation, but that he himself is the effective agent in the redemptive work, from beginning to end. It is the word of God incarnate who overcomes the tyrants that hold man in bondage. God himself enters into the world of sin and death, that he may reconcile the world to himself. Therefore, incarnation and atonement stand in no sort of antithesis. Rather, they belong inseparably together. It is God's love, the divine agape, that removes the sentence that rested upon mankind and creates a new relation between the human race and himself, a relation that is altogether different from any sort of justification by legal righteousness. The whole dispensation is the work of grace. Mankind that had fallen into captivity is now by God's mercy delivered out of the power of them that held them in bondage. God had mercy upon his creation, and bestowed upon them a new salvation through his word, that is, Christ, so that men might learn by experience that they cannot attain to incorruption of themselves, but by God's grace only. Second, it is to be emphasized that this view of the atonement has regularly a dualistic background, namely, the reality of forces of evil, which are hostile to the divine will. Consequently, so far as the sphere of these forces extends, there is enmity between God and the world. The work of atonement is therefore depicted in dramatic terms, as a conflict with the powers of evil and a triumph over them. This involves a necessary double-sidedness, in that God is at once the reconciler and the reconciled, his enmity is taken away in the very act in which he reconciles the world unto himself. Now, this is what G Gustav Aulin, I am going to harp on him some more. Gustav Aulin says about Augustine, let me quote him. He says that Augustine, in Augustine's opinion, um, the atonement is, quote, one divine work. It is one divine work, the continuity of which is not interrupted by the idea of an offering made to God from man's side, from below. Gustav Aulin do it in his book, which is central to the guys, and he's a scholar, 
therefore rejecting PSA because he's into, in, into Christus Victor. I'll get into Christus Victor later in more detail. It's just the idea that Jesus had victory over Satan, sin, and the world. Um, and Ephesus said with Cyril, if you read uh, St. Cyril's on the unity of Christ against Nestorius, and if you read, um, and by the way, I've read all that. I've read Nestorius's writings too. Um, and I've read uh, John McGuckin's book uh, on St. Cyril and the Christological Controversy, which is really good. St. Cyril said, uh, there's only one person there, and that's the Son of God. There's no human person in Christ whatsoever at all. There's a human nature, a fully human nature, but there is no human hypostasis in Christ at all. And so it became the norm for St. Cyril and for those at the Council of Ephesus to, to say that the sole subject in all the actions of Christ within time and space into the resurrection and eternity, the only subject there for all of them is the divine person of the Logos. The only one. That's it. No two Jesuses. Jesus Nazareth is the Son of God. There is no human person in Christ at all whatsoever, period. Boom. Once you grasp that, you will be on your way to orthodoxy. And I, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a scholar. I'm not trying to pretend to be a scholar, but I.